So the definition of shear stress or shear force starts by a description of Coulomb uh, friction. So you've probably already come across Coulomb friction as part, as part of your introductory physics, but let's recap on what that is now. Um, so imagine you had a block that was sitting on some sort of surface. Um, we know that that block would um, subject the surface to a normal force due to its own weight. So the weight of the block would create a normal force um, acting on that surface. Let's call that N. If I subjected that block to a horizontal force, so if I tried to push it in this direction, initially when I subjected a small force to that, it wouldn't move. Um, and it would only start moving when the applied force overcame the frictional force. So we know that there's a, um, there's a frictional force created by the, the, the interaction of the surface and the block. We'll call that F and we'll call the applied force A. So. So the, the block would only start moving when A was greater than F. So when A was greater than F, we know that the block would move. We also know that F is um, proportional to or equal to the uh, applied, the normal force um, multiplied by some coefficient of friction. So F equals the normal force uh, multiplied by coefficient of friction mu. Okay, and because of this, this relationship, we can um, put these two things together and we say that the block wouldn't move until uh, A was greater than uh, the, applied, uh, the, the normal force multiplied by the coefficient of friction. So instead of uh, looking at this as a cartoon of a block, let's simplify it into a, into a force diagram. So we, we, we take away the block and the surface and we just represent the forces uh, acting on a single point. So let's have a point here. And we have our normal force, N. We have an applied force, we have a frictional force, um, and what's missing here is some sort of resistive force um, from the, the surface. So let's say we have a resistive force. Oh. So we've taken that cartoon and we've represented it as a simple force diagram. Now what we can do next is we can, we can com combine these, these two resistive forces, I suppose the resist normal resistive force from the surface and the frictional force into a single force um, acting at some angle, call that phi, from the, uh, from the vertical. So we've combined these two forces into a single force. So that new resistive force is acting at phi from the vertical. And then this angle is given a special name. It's called the angle of friction. Um, and it's given the symbol phi. So tan phi must be equal to the frictional force over the normal force. So we can see here that the, the larger the, um, the angle of friction, so the larger this angle is, the larger the frictional force that's um, generated proportional to the normal force. 
So we can see that larger angle of fric friction means that we've got a, a rougher or a, a more frictional surface. So we can see that this angle of friction has a relationship with the coefficient of friction, um, where the coefficient of friction f equals n times mu. If we write it just in terms of mu, you have um, mu equals f over n. So we can see that tan phi is equal to mu. So it's quite convenient uh, to think of uh, surfaces or materials in terms of their angle of friction because you take out the, um, or you, you resolve the relationship or you resolve two parameters, um, the relationship between the frictional force um, and the uh, normal force into just one parameter. So just going back to this cartoon uh, for a second, if we wanted to um, represent this in terms of stress rather than force, what I could do is take my normal force, N, and divide that by the contact area between the block and the, 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 the horizontal surface. So if I took N and divided it by the contact area, what I'd be left with is my stress. But the same would be true if I did that for my frictional force. And what I'd be left with is a shear stress. So what would happen, do you think, if I uh, drilled a hole through this, this block? So I drilled a hole uh, through the center of the block. And I injected water uh, into that hole. So I filled some water into the hole. Um, so the hole goes all the way through the block and uh, comes out the other side. So the water would then um, permeate through and, until it uh, spread between the two surfaces. You can see that we'd have um, some level of water pressure um, between these two, two surfaces. Um, and that would then lower the, the um, amount of applied force that I needed to move the block. So you can see that the importance of effective stress when it comes to whether the block slides or not is really quite important. So um, my effective stress would be the, um, the, to the, so my effective stress would be equal to the, this total stress minus whatever pore water, water pressure was um, now between the, the block and the, the surface. So that's why it's important to represent soils in terms of effective stress rather than total stress, because it's the effective stress that governs whether soils fail.